Good morning. Thank you, Bia, for the opportunity, for the invitation of speaking here. Thank you for your presence. Um, I'll try to, uh, to speak not too much, but I have a lot, quite a lot to say. Uh, <laughs> So we can, you know, talk and discuss and ask questions. I think the idea of a workshop is we are including the participation of participants, so uh, people who are watching, not only watching, but uh, speaking their own minds. So um, I'm a psychiatrist. I used to be uh, in the UDV, one of the ayahuasca religions. I'm not a member anymore. And I'm studying uh, ayahuasca for a while, not a long time. Basically, my background is on, thank you, Bia. My background is on um, mental health services and psychosocial, psychosocial rehabilitation, more like a health services researcher. Um, and recently I've, I've been interested for obvious reasons from a personal contact with ayahuasca and I've been studying this for a while. I, since this is the, the first presentation, I'll give an introduction to the theme. I'm, 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 I'm really sorry if you're already well, the people that are here, of course, know a lot. But just to make sure that everyone understands what I'm, we are talking about. So I'll give you a, a small um, introduction to the psychopharmacology of ayahuasca. And I think with some comments that I think I would be, it would be interesting for us to reflect upon. And then I'll talk about a little bit uh, from my perspective of what do we know about ayahuasca and health. And, and then what I think is, it should be for, uh, in my perspective, most important part of this presentation is to discuss how this applies to the safety to, and for the regulation of ayahuasca and the legalization of ayahuasca usage. And also some ideas that I share of uh, how we can move forward, some ideas for research, and obviously some, this is ba ba these are basically ideas that came to my mind and I, I'm, we are open to discuss other new ideas as well because there are plenty. So about ayahuasca and its pharmacology. Uh, you probably know that ayahuasca is made, uh, at least in its most famous form, as a combination of two plants. One is Banisteriopsis caapi, a vine. And, and I'm starting uh, with it, uh, although uh, normally it's pain, uh, uh, psychedelic science tends to pay more attention on the DMT. I'm um, it, it is my intention to start discussing about the, the by the, the vine, because in most traditions, the name of the brew is the name of this plant, not the other plant. And I think this is very important for us to keep in mind. And perhaps for a new agenda of research, paying attention on the uh, alkaloids that are present in this plant material. This is uh, an enzyme called monamine oxidase, MAO, uh, which has the function of de degra degradate some um, compounds. Some of them are psychoactive, some of them are not. And it's present in, your, in our uh, digestory system and also in our brains uh, throughout the, the body. And I'm starting by it because in this, we can see in this picture, we have a small molecule that's attached to this uh, structure of this is a representation it's not this is not the real enzyme it's one of the ways of representing it and while this small molecule blocks this uh, enzyme it for a while it doesn't work this substance and this is important I'm gonna tell you why later you probably mo many of, of you already know that this in this uh, substance uh, this alkaloid in this case is called amine, but other uh, in, a in, a, in a set of um, alkaloids called beta-carbolines, which include, but not only these, these are the most important in, in ayahuasca, harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroarmine. All of them have this blocking pro properties of one type of monamine oxidase and um, a reversible blockage, so after a while, the, uh, the alkaloid is dis dislodged from the site of the enzyme and it works again. These substances are found in many plant species. So, when it's Iopsis carpi, you can find it in a patient. I, I think it's better if I change the microphone. Thanks. No, 
it's okay because I, otherwise I don't, I'll, I'll don't know what to do with my hands, so it's better if I have the microphone. <laughs> Thanks. Well, then uh, passion, passion fruits, some, some passion fruits have also some, some not only, no, not the same, but they also have some beta carolines, and also Peganoir mala, the searing rue, and other plants as well. Um, so they have as uh, um, biological properties, a high affinity for one specific, there are two enzymes called MAO, MAO A and MAO B, and it's specific for MAO A. And also, I want to show you this, I don't want to go through this very in, in many details, but just to let you know that it's not only, obviously, for those who, who know a little bit more about biology, is that um, in, in biology there is parsimony, and some, sub, some uh, substances have many uh, sites of uh, action or possible action. So this is important for you to know. The specific in the case of Harmin, it's not only there. I mean, it's not. It's only function, or we can only say of functioning because. But th it's its property. It's not only to block Mayo A, but also it has connections to other receptors, including 5HT. 2A, which is considered, it's, it's known as the psychedelic receptor. So, uh, and then there's this discussion whether better carbolines by themselves might have a psychedelic uh, effect. This is not very clear at all for the moment. Uh, it's, uh, we, what we know, if it has a psychedelic effect by itself, it's very mild. Even though there are some traditions that only drink a tea made from the vine. And this is also important for us to, to keep in mind, I think, if we are thinking about an agenda that's going to study ayahuasca, and we have lots of things to learn. And uh, uh, also it affects the dopamine transporter, and also a little bit uh, with a lesser extent as well, uh, other uh, serotonin receptors. But then, it's not only that, one point very important for the ayahuasca experience is uh, this plant, Psychotra viridis. It's not only this uh, uh, plant that might have this other important alkaloid, which is known as DMT. And I'm, I'm putting um, an image of a serotonin molecule for you to see how similar it is from serotonin. And uh, it attaches to the psychedelic receptor, as I said and induces psychedelic experiences, but it is degraded once you uh, it, it gets into the dig digestory tract. Then it's with the presence of the bad carolines, and not only in the brain, this is very important because this reaction also has to happen in the gut, uh, it, the degradation by Mao of this substance is blocked by the bad carolines during the moment of the ingestion of ayahuasca. So it goes into the blood and the blood brain barrier, and then uh, uh, the subjective effects of DMT are going to happen in a very different, or in a somewhat different way from the injected or the smoked uh, version of DMT. Not only because of the peak that is very slow, but also because there is, in my opinion, the modulation of the beta carbolines. So, in my opinion, the beta carbolines is not la um, the, the vine is not there just only to be a vehicle for DMT. For the ayahuasca experience, we have to consider the two parts. I think this is very important. We are, it's not very clear for us in science which, are, which is the part played by the beta carb lines. I'm, I'm stressing that because I think this is important to be studied in the future. Um, and then again, DMT, it's not only an agonist of the uh, psychedelic receptor, but also other receptors with the it's important to say that it's found to be the endogenous li ligand of the mysterious sigma-1 receptor, which we don't quite know what is it for, but it, it seems to be promising to study that in terms also in, in terms of treatment of mental disorders as well. So it's, it's, we have some new things also in this field to understand more. Okay, having said that, I'd like to address some general biomedical aspects of ayahuasca. And, um, it is, what I'm going to present to you, it's, a, it's a, a not a very comprehensive review, it is uh, uh, abridged, so if you want to add uh, some ideas or some um, new information you might add at the end, there's no problem about it, I'm, because uh, uh, due to time restraints I have to go a little bit slow, uh, a little bit fast on that. So what do we know about the physical effects, more common physical e effects of ayahuasca? It's not only that, but this, these are the most common. 
you, uh, the person may experience nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, not all the times, but frequently. Also, there is the register of a mild increase in cardiac frequency and blood pressure. Normally, in a situation that wouldn't um, uh, cause any risk, but for people who ha might have some problems regarding these issues, it's probably to be uh, careful, it's important to be careful in this regard. Also, some other autonomic effects, tremor is it's, it's common, sometimes uh, visual effects, um, rarely fainting may happen as well, and other effects that you probably know, but these are the most common, the most important for us to stress at the moment. Um, considering the subjective uh, psychological effects, uh, from what we can gather from the literature, apart from the own ayahuasca experience of any of everyone, of, of any of you who have drank this brew, uh, drank this brew, uh, people experience changes in perception, body perception, and cognition. This comes from the HRS, the hallucinogenic rating scale, and less clearly also in the intensity and affect uh, dimensions of HRS. Um, these changes in perception, they are very particular, um, they are most common observed, and if you've seen uh, Draulius Palestra, uh, Draulius lecture, <laughs> sorry, it's not in Portuguese, um, he's, he addressed the issue of uh, closing the eyes, which is very important in the Ayahuasca experience, uh, images become more vividly vivid when you close your eyes. So this is very particular of this uh, experience. Also, uh, might happen. We, we, this also happens with DMT, pure DMT. And, um, but it's not like the common psychedelic experience of seeing of distortions, illusions, or even hallucinations. True hallucinations. They may happen. Illusions and hallucinations might happen, but it's not so common. It's actually very rare. Of course, depending on the dose set and setting. Um, and we may say that the effects in terms of psychedelia is they are modest compared to pure DMT, which is more or less obvious. Um, and then um, there's always this question. I've been in many places talking about ayahuasca in Brazil, also in the in the in the House of Congress, and I presented a variation of this presentation there. And one of the obvious questions people make uh, when someone hasn't drink ayahuasca. It's why people drink ayahuasca, it's to feel these uh, distortions of reality, to feel this nausea, to vomit. So the, the main important thing, and all, all the traditions stress that, is, uh, and I'm going to translate it into a westernized psychological speech, is that we may find, in, it, this is not so exclusive of ayahuasca, of course, but we might find an increase in insight and auto-analysis. In, in and this auto-analysis, particularly in the case of Iowa, uh, and ayahuasca, come, may come from um, a similar to uh, external entity impression. So you may find that it is a, a, a god, uh, an advisor, a maestro, a mestre, who is giving you some advice. And of course, people may inter interpret it in many ways, some impossible interpretations. It's, it's that in some sort, the, the own person uh, might be in some sort of way assessing some unconscious material and bringing it forth in a more conscious way in as a separate uh, self. That might happen uh, normally in humans. In, it, this is a process known called dissociation, but in ayahuasca, this is very strong. And, and people would say, ayahuasca told me that, or the mastery told me that, and so on. People interpret like that, that way. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to um, define which is this. I'm, I'm just telling you how often this happens. I don't intend to, I mean, say that there, there are spirits or there are no spirits. So I leave your beliefs, I leave, I leave your beliefs for, for you, for yourselves about that. And also something that's very important, it's that um, the subject may undergo a review of past acts that might be judged as objectionable, questionable in terms of moral. And that's, that is very commonly um, associated with strong reactions in terms of diarrhea and, and especially vomiting. And it's called, as in the Brazilian traditions of ayahuasca, a spanking a translation. Eh? Tr I, I, I went into a spanking. I was spanked. Uh, and this is very common. This is very common uh, in, you know, in the ayahuasca religions in Brazil. And also, peia in Portuguese, for those who speak Portuguese. It's a very regional word for spanking, peia. 
And, um, and also the sense of oneness, which is common to many psychedelics, the idea of feeling an integration of self and, and the world and everything, and the metaphysical world as well. Um, also, also think uh, uh, an aspect that's very important for people for keeping drinking ayahuasca because um, the reactions may be very strong. And of course, we're, tr we're talking here about there are many ways of drinking ayahuasca. So there is the typical intense curandero way, and, and even the ayahuasca is more concentrated in these situations. And people come from somewhere else for a, a, a period of healing. And this is, I mean, the person is not supposed to be drinking ayahuasca for the rest of, of, of his or her life. So it's a, it's a more intense, like a crash course. And t uh, the ayahuasca religions tend to drink less concentrated ayahuasca in a more regular basis. But even though situations can be very strong. And, and the question is why people go there to suffer <laughs> that? And one of the reasons uh, is that it, there is a feeling of euthymia which is also common to many psychedelics, in the following weeks, a psychic wellness. Um, we may say that um, this, there's uh, uh, an interesting information uh, from the data gathered by Joel Pinto, a psychiatrist in Ribeirão Preto, Brazil. He, he gave ayahuasca to depressed patients and he scored the depression scales and they followed the depression scales and the drop in there was a drop in depressive uh, symptoms. He he didn't had controls in this study. It was a very sim very preliminary study, but what he found is that the symptoms started to rise again after fif like 15 days, around 15 days. There is not a coincidence that ayahuasca religions in Brazil drink ayahuasca around each 15 days, each two weeks. It's very inter interesting to have this in mind as well. And this is the tip type of thing, this information, um, that it's very important, it, it, I wanted to stress this because this might bring for us, uh, the, it, it brings for us the importance of talking to those who are, uh, who have the knowledge of this technology in, sh in shamanic and traditional ways. When I saw this information in the Brazilian Congress of Psychiatry, it was a presentation, they didn't know this fact about the periodicity of the Brazilian uh, ayahuasca religions, so I had to tell them. I told them, and they, of course they found it very interesting, so, but this shows how this dialogue is important and how this traditional uh, knowledge um, reinforces and, pu uh, and pushes forward science, in my opinion, this is very important. So also there's this famous anti-dependence, anti-drug misuse effect, which is probably which is better uh, documented in terms of ayahuasca. We still don't have the famous uh, uh, clinical trials with you know with all this the num big numbers and but we can fairly know and of course for for the observation for the for a long time of people who are working we can see that this is there is clearly an effect a positive effect on dependence on treatment of drug misuse in general. And also a general increase in self-knowledge, the type of thing that people would search in psychotherapy, for instance. Well, in, I'll, I'll, this is a summary of the literature. There is also another, um, another chapter, the chapter from Ayahuasca and Salud. I didn't have time to put it there, so it's also by, by Rafael dos Santos. But in general, what we can say is that Ayahuasca is, it points, it points for general safety. Um, we c uh, this is also that uh, Bia's question to Francisco was very important about what did he think about those deaths? Because uh, we don't really know what happened there. And, and we don't know what it was inside that ayahuasca, what happened, if the, one of the situations the guy fell, what might have happened? So, um, because in, t in general terms, why we could keep record, uh, the ayahuasca tr uh, experience seems to be very safe. Uh, of course, for someone who is very ill, it's not recommended that the person drinks uh, full doses. And also, there, there's the, the issue of mental health, but this is another topic I'm going to address in a while. Um, and then we might say that there might be uh, the therapeutic use, and I mean here I'm talking about physical care in general. Uh, we basically don't have results. I'm just I'm <laughs> very preliminary. It's just is a way of saying that we we have anecdotal information about people who tell uh, someone who cured a cancer or stuff like that. Um, 
There are different settings for that. We have really healing centers, and also these healing centers may be um, t uh, targeting different outcomes, uh, sometimes drug use, sometimes drug use and general wellness, sometimes mental health, emotional problems, and also uh, physical problems. And um, we also have to have an approach to that. I think it's important to get it. it we are still in the, in the moment of gathering uh, qualitative information as well. It's very important this. And also there's this very important question and this has been discussed for in the literature and also in the li ayahuasca literature so I won't go uh, very far about it. But uh, there is the question of what is a cure? What is to be cure? Um, is it a cure the person accepting, uh, the person's acceptance of uh, his or her own illness? That might be a cure, depending on the situation in psychotherapeutic terms for, for, for certain. So we also have to remind that, be reminded of that. About mental health in general, what we see is, uh, I mean, when I'm talking about the majority of population, is that we have uh, an idea of positive effects. We have some evidence from animal models uh, of depression, that there is a possible antidepressive effect in uh, ayahuasca. Also, uh, Rafael Santos has studied the reduction of anxiety symptoms, but not in, uh, it wasn't a clinical trial, just w once again, in this, in this kind of situation, we had a person administer a scale, and then ayahuasca, and then a scale again. There's also the study from Joel Pinto about uh, depression symptoms. I guess it wasn't published, I cannot cite it, but I can, as a personal communication, I can tell you. Uh, Paul Barbosa studied also in terms of uh, first users, people who went for the first time to drink ayahuasca, he evaluated them before and after, and uh, they had no psychiatric situations, but they had, he, he used some scales of uh, mental wellness and, and, and uh, personal feelings, and people had a positive uh, subjective evaluation, and the reduction of minor neuroticism symptoms, increase of feelings of assertivity and vivacity. Um, also, this was more strong, and he studied the uh, DIME and UDV, and this was more clearly seen in the DIME subjects. Also, there is a possible pr uh, effect of protective, uh, sorry, a possible protective effect of ayahuasca against drug misuse, as has been documented for many uh, papers now. And then the possibility that might have, um, um, and then it's it's very good to have Charles Grobe here because we can discuss that as well. I have discussed a little bit with him after his talk. Uh, um, but um, there's a paper, uh, an old paper, 1998, about the putative risk of serotonin syndrome uh, while taking ayahuasca and antidepressants at the same time. And from experience we can gather, and this is, uh, I mean, from psychiatrists like myself who have treated a lot of people from one of the ayahuasca religions. Some of these people came to me already taking uh, antidepressant and already drinking ayahuasca. Some of them came drinking ayahuasca and with symptoms of depression and anxiety and I prescribed the, the antidepression myself after being aware of seeing the this previous cases that this pe the, the, the reaction, the reaction, I've never seen a strong reaction. Uh, to tell you the truth, there's one, one case of a woman that was taking uh, well actually, the first case I saw, she was um, using uh, sertraline, and she had very strong vomiting. That's that's what she had. Uh, there, there are absolutely no reports that could lead to a undoubtful um, serotonin syndrome. Even in my opinion, the case that is described in this paper, because there wasn't hypothermia, hyperthermia. Uh, the, the subject, there wasn't a report of th that the subject had fever. Of course, probably people didn't measure that, so, <laughs> but anyway. Um, in, in my opinion, when I read that paper, I get a feeling of the, a very, very strong beer, a very strong spanking. I've seen lots of spankings like that, that uh, I would describe it, with no uh, use of antidepressants. Might the fluoxetine that the subject was using influence that? I probably yes. Probably yeah. I would say so. That, but not in the terms of uh, a very risky situation such as a serotonin syndrome. But we have to be aware that if a person has a, a um, 
problems, uh, uh, serious problems of health. And my taking this antidepressant, it may be the first time, because it seems that the effect is less stronger when the, the person is already a, a frequent ayahuasca drinker, um, that might be a risk. So we, we cannot uh, just ignore that. Okay, our data from, from our survey from the UDV that are presented here at MAPS showed that um, when people took ayahuasca and antidepressants, uh, effects were described in more or less one third of them. And from this one third of them, most of them reported the increasing of effects and uh, or, and or an unple unpleasant situation. And some of them have said that the effect was milder, and a few of them had said that the effect was more pleasant. So it's also complex to interpret that. And we have to do more studies as well to understand this better, obviously. Well, well this, is, this is, Bia has addressed that when she was launching the, the book, and this is very important. This is probably the most important risk we uh, we have to face when you're talking about ayahuasca is the risk of psychosis. Most, from what we studied in, in our, in the sample of the, I have done a study on the sample of the UDV, um, this, we can say that these cases are not very common, and especially those cases uh, of psychosis are, are mostly cases of people with previous history of psychosis that have stopped taking medication or started drinking ayahuasca, either or. But there are real new cases that have been merged with ayahuasca, and we have to be aware of that. We cannot ignore that. And this, is, this, may this may happen. But we have to think that this may happen. This happens in life as well. So we, uh, psychotic outbreaks happen in many strong situations in life. Since the ayahuasca experience, it is a, a strong experience. It might be a very strong experience. That might happen. And not only by, in my opinion, not only by the uh, uh, neurotransmitter aspect, but also in terms of psychological impact. Uh, of course, I can't prove that. It's just an opinion. Um, what I can say, and the Daimi and the UDV at the moment, they have some sort of lay triage about who they are going to give uh, ayahuasca or not, or who, can, who couldn't get uh, drink ayahuasca. And it, normally it seems that this process of avoiding people with a history of, of uh, psychosis uh, or seeing someone is a little bit uh, weird and too much for what the person thinks is normality, they would ask for the help for a doctor or for a psychiatrist, depending on the situation. There are a lot of now of doctors who are within this religion, so it's not, depending on the place, it's not very difficult to have a, a second opinion on that. I've, I've done a lot of them, act actually. Um, so that's it. We have, um, it, it. There are ways of making some, you know, barriers for these uh, episodes to happen without having to medicalize. But the, uh, as always, uh, there's no 100% safe um, operation. Um, also, we have to acknowledge another thing. It's, it has to be with values, because nobody really questions antidepressants, and antidepressants are the substances who drive, more commonly drive people, especially from a depression state to a maniac state. So they induce psychosis. And no, no one wants to, for hip to, to prohibit antidepressants because of that. And that's why, that's why, that's because the, it, it's, it is acknowledged that these substances have an importance and a use. So the point here, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll get to this later again about this values question, is um, why is there is this tendency of, in the case of ayahuasca, always looking on the bright side, especially for those who aren't into the psychedelic uh, science circle, which is most <laughs> of scientists. Um, there in, in Brazil, while there was the, the regulation of religious use of ayahuasca, there were some rules, deontological rules, deontological suggestions, recommendations that have to be followed, and uh, they uh, recommend that 
those who are interested in drinking ayahuasca for the first time to have individual interviews. And in these interviews, uh, people should ask about the, the history of severe, severe mental disorder, the use of the medication, especially uh, intera possible interaction medications, and drugs, drugs uh, of abuse or of misuse. And um, they recommend that people, they shouldn't be offered ayahuasca to people with a history of a severe mental disorder, and this is also very broad because it's difficult to define it as a severe me mental disorder. Depression can be very severe and not necessarily you shouldn't give ayahuasca to someone with depression, depending, of course, of suicidality. Um, also, it's important to avoid to offer ayahuasca to those who are under the effect of other psychoactive substances. People who have drank alcohol and taken ayahuasca may um, go a very severe spanking. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, it was going to be very brief and there are a lot of points to add, but the point I want to get now is about values. So, is the available biomedical evidence for safety of the use of ayahuasca is enough? Can we say that? Can we just say that we, it is the point of saying that it's legal, we have to legalize it for, or regulate that for medical use? And the other question is, which are the determinants, which are the values that, in, that um, guide the interpretation of the biomedical data? And we should not be naive, because we are going to have a very pro-interpretation of this data, but people outside here not. And we have to be aware of that whenever we are talking to them in terms of advocacy. And that's one of the points I want to talk about advocacy uh, a minute later. So um, then, which is the role of biomedical evidence in the regulation of ayahuasca? I'd like to share with you some ideas, and these are not closed, and probably you're gonna have new contributions. This, 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 I'm going to show you to you a diagram, and this diagram is it's a work on progr in, pro in progress, and in where we are going to see, we are going to think about uh, which are the values and uh, um, which are the determinants of this ayahuasca regulation. So, first, first in this case, because we like to look at it, uh, this is important for us, we have to remember that ayahuasca has therapeutic effects, and it's important to show people that. Uh, also, we may see that Ayahuasca may have a positive effect in society. This has been discussed in some papers. Uh, people from the Alto Santo, one of the uh, one of the groups of the Daimi, uh, have special claims of how uh, Daimi community was important for the region of Rio Branco, where it spread, and it's a, a, an area with less violence, for instance. There is some evidence of that, in that region. It hasn't been published, but there is this, this, this data is available. So it, it, might be, it might be that ayahuasca and its effects of uh, personal growth and spiritual growth may also lead to a, a growth and a, a development in society. And also, of course, we're talking about the stereotypic effects working on society. Uh, not always is, is like that. Bia, of course, had a lot of <laughs> stories that are not so beautiful about ayahuasca, but it, we have to remember that it might be so good. Also, the issue of how this society treats religious freedom and human rights. Uh, and this is very important when we... we the, the book Bia edited on, and, and Enric Junggaberle edited on the globalization of ayahuasca, there is an excellent session about how it went in the different countries, or it didn't, <laughs> actually how it, it didn't go in some countries. And, and this is a very, it's interesting to see how the ways of regulation, of the regulation of ayahuasca might be different depending on the values that are, in that, uh, are important in that society. So religious freedom was a very important way in the United States. Also, it had an important role in Brazil. In Peru, the tradition of the, of the curanderos very strong was the way that was acknowledged there. Uh, so it depends on the place, depends on the country, depends on how this country is suspicious of other religions. France, for instance, is terrible about that. They even have a, a special government section for uh, the fight against sects, which is a bit strange for me, but anyway, that happens there. So that's how they say it's a, ve it's a very advanced society in terms of, of human rights, but 
what about religion, religious freedom? So this also has to do with the concept of religion and how this society sees religion. There's another value that has to be acknowledged and worked upon. And then we have the perception of risk to public health. And I'm using this word perception intentionally. Because we are always talking about the perception of risks. And we tend, depending on the situation, to exaggerate or diminish risks depending on the values that we are. There's no uh, science without commitment, commitment to values. It depends on which values we are judging. The idea of a, th a theoretical biomedicine does not exist, of course. But pro people who say that ayahuasca is not safe, they are not aware of that. So it doesn't, it's, it's not a, sometimes not a, depending on the situation, on the political confront, confrontation. It might be not so wise to say that, oh, you're, you're wrong because the, you're, you're working with values that uh, are not our values. So you also have to be wise in these terms. How are we going to address that? So sometimes you just have to go into the data. And sometimes you have to see other values to be worked. So, and then there's the situation of the real risk. And then real, between quotations, because I don't know which is the real risk. We don't know which is the real we, It is it's still a work in progress. We have to be aware of that. But I want to make a, a brief comment about a, um, a paper, newspaper article that I just read this morning. I have to include it in the presentation because it's about MAPS, Psycho Psychedelic Science 2013, that was published in Brazil. And with quotations of Darcy, Draulio, Bia, and there is a quote from a, a famous psychi psychiatrist in Brazil who works with drug misuse, Artur Guerra. And uh, it is said, for more, but for more orthodox, there's the, the article goes speaking about all the new things, that are, well, new discoveries and the approach that we're seeing here. But near, the end, but near the end, but for more orthodox researchers, there are still a few missing steps before the therapeutic use of hallucinogens before the therapeutic use of hallucinogens becomes a fact. Arthur Guerra, director of the Alcohol and Drug Program from the Universidade de São Paulo, argues, I see these experiences with great concern, he says. Any, uh, any, it's not any conduct, any act that is not sufficiently evidence-based implies risk. Any act of any kind implies risk. This is obvious. Given an antidepressant implies risk, implies risk as well. So that's so the problem is not a risk. The problem is the value behind the risk. Law enforcement, of course. How is this in this country? How in, in, the, in let's say in the country we are studying as a theoretical country? How are drug policies? But not only that, we have to go a, a step back and see how is the government, the ideology, in terms of law enforcement and drug policies. Because this is going to be, depending on the situation, depending on the, on the position of, of, of a, a government, it may be tougher or not. And then also we have to address what is a drug in this regard for this country. So I, this is a, a picture from the visual thesaurus. It's a um, service in the internet where you can you can fill, uh, fill in a word, a word, and then all the connected um, information is, is graphically depicted. And I, I don't have here a pointer. There's, there's no pointer here, so I'll have to describe it. Um, near the concept of drug, we may find a lot of things. Most of these names are situations for specific actions of, of physical actions of drugs like my, uh, my, my driatric, um, arbortifacient, synergist, whatever. But then you're gonna find down here to the left, psychoactive drug, mind-altering drug, conscious-altering drug, psychoactive substance. This is a group, a cluster. Oh, obrigado, Dr. This, this is a cluster. Then this is the cluster that mostly in, uh, is uh, our, of our interest, though also we may think that the whole bunch of um, treatment drugs also may apply, may apply to ayahuasca in some sense, to a certain strength. And then we may have um, street drug and drug of abuse here. This is the, one of the groups. Also, there is another one I wanted to tell you. 
is the part of medicinal drug, medication, medicament, medicine, and all that. So uh, also, how this concept of drug is treated is not a very straightforward situation. We, can, we cannot take for granted anything. We have to look upon and see how each society defines this. And also, this is important. It's important for us to think that the values of each society influences quite a lot of how the way this society deals with drugs in general. In a, in a, now I'm talking about those who are called illicit drugs, and drugs of abuse, actually. Um, this is a, a, a graphic that is portrayed in the book of Alex Stevens, a very interesting book about, uh, book about drug policy I, I recommended to you, and in where he plotted the prevalence of past year cannabinoids, cannab cannabis use uh, for 15-year-olds, uh, he, he had this data for all these countries, and he also worked upon a, okay, call, what he called a decommodification index, which is, would portray the amount of how much a society would not see persons as objects, as commodities. So the far you go to this size, the less people are seeing our commodities. Um, um, there's a country here. Uh, <laughs> you can see, you can see it. And there is a, a fairly linear rea uh, uh, connection between the prevalence. It might be just one data that he found that is it was um, positively related. I don't want to go into the criticism of the data, and this is also uh, what they call in epidemiology and ecological data, and so it's always subject to criticism. But anyway, what I want to tell you is that we have to have a look on that. How is the way that, uh, not only directly, how a society addresses dr a drug, but how it addresses people, persons? What are the values that people have there? And this might also. In my country, for instance, one very strong problem is uh, the um, uh, wealth inequality, which is very well connected to violence and the violence and use of drugs. So it depends on each society. And here's the whole picture, so far. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to suggest that we discuss uh, new research. And I'll just give you some ideas I've been thinking, and some, I, some of these slides have been modified because of talks I had with Siddhartha and Draulio and other people here. And uh, I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy to listen to your suggestions as well. So, obviously we have to address uh, the issue of therapeutic effects and the treatment of substance misuse and depression, and obviously this, there are protocols that are being planned to, and uh, Draulio actually, actually has a very, uh, it's, it, it's about, he's about to start a protocol on depression. And Darcio is studying substance misuse in Brazil as well. And then we might think about other possible health conditions, and this is putative, but anyway, uh, the idea that uh, beta carbolins may be, uh, may, may be positive for parasites, the use for Parkinson's disease, the use for m migraine, Peter Eddy and Andy Siro are studying this. So we have, and then, etc., etc., etc. Joe Tarford brought some interesting perspectives of what we could be study as well, in terms of, for instance, uh, psycho, um, how do you say? Neuroimmunology. Neuroimmunology, but I wanted to say the old, the old fashioned word, I just forgot it. Uh, psychosomatic, it's the old fashioned one. <laughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> and then, um, then the idea of, but then I think this is possibly, we, we, we have to, um, perhaps not moment. I know that Brian, Brian Rush think that we must at the moment work in a more uh, service research, uh, service systems research, which is also very important. And for people who are working with controlled studies, there are some questions that, in my opinion, have to be addressed. There is still the mystery of the disappearance of harming in uh, freeze diet ayahuasca. I don't know why this happens. I'm not a technician in this situation. Well, what I know is that um, Jace Calloway have assessed um, the blood of people who had drank liquid ayahuasca and harmin was present. In, the, in RIBA studies, there was, it wasn't liquid ayahuasca and harmin wasn't present. I don't know if, the, if this was an artifact or not, 
But you have to know what is happening. We have to compare. We have to make studies comparing freeze dyes with liquid ayahuasca and measurements. We still don't have them. Um, also, a very important thing is how to include in the treatment, if we move fo forward and if we decide that really we have to treat people with ayahuasca, is how to include the ritual component in the clinical trials. I won't go much uh, on this because this is more or less the same for all. I mean, it has been addressed during this conference for basically all psychedelics, but you know how it goes. Well, um, this is a very tricky point. Uh, pregnancy and the use in, in, in childhood. Uh, for, for the traditions in Brazil uh, and in South America in general, children drink ayahuasca and pregnant women, as you heard from Francisco's story, about his story, uh, pregnant women as well. Um, however, we have an, uh, an, a toxicological evidence for in pregnant rats the, uh, of some risk. Um, toxicological studies, we have to be a little bit, um, uh, we have to be aware that they, they, they look for the idea of using huge doses and see whether you might find some sort of toxicological effect or not. The idea is not implying that if you find this kind of situation in rats is going to be applicable to humans, especially because if you consider two things, the amount that was given to these rats was huge in the situation, really huge. And the second thing is that rats don't vomit. Rodents don't vomit. We also might think which animal is the best animal for experiences with ayahuasca, if you think that this is ethical. There's another issue about this. <laughs> um, but then we need epidemiological studies case control study, cohort studies, uh, using the Brazilian populations, for instance, or here in the US or whatever, uh, probably in the US they're not given because it's more controlled, but anyway, we have to have a look on the data it's av that's available. In a recent, I, I got some data from the UDV, and there are, in Brazil, around 400 persons whose mother had taken ayahuasca in their wombs. So there's a, there's a population for a study. They have to go to it. Uh, and, and let me just say something regarding this issue of values. For instance, in Brazil, there is no prohibition about that. So children, of course, there is. You, you, you have to imagine, you have to understand that giving ayahuasca to children is not like filling up a, a glass and giving. There is, you know, a way of doing it with small amounts and, and a very sparse, sparse, scarce um, rituals until they get to their teenage years and then they start really drinking. Near, more or less like adults. So there is, uh, it's not like giving, it's, it's not, a, a, the idea is not giving a child the full ayahuasca experience as you would go give to a, an adult, because an adult supposedly has to deal with it, ha has uh, ways of dealing with it, and it's not the case of a child, or perhaps not. Um, so um, in Brazil, this is an issue of cultural issue, so it's allowed. It's, it's not, it's this, this situation wasn't brought for discussion, it's just allowed. It's just like it would be allowed for Indians, for Native, Native American or Native Brazilians in this case. Um, then we need, um, this is, this, we are doing this at the moment, the, the follow-up of case reports in, in within the uh, Iowa Scale Group in case of the interaction of SSRIs and um, ayahuasca. Also, animal studies, and I have the information that the first animal study about the interaction of SSRI and ayahuasca has been done. The results aren't published yet, but they point toward the safety as well. So the interaction, it was funny because the, when the guy wrote the email to me, he said, it's Fulvio Mendes, the name of the author, he's from a Brazilian university. He said to me, um, there wasn't any toxical uh, effects, but there wasn't also any kind of synergic effect of potentialization. They expected that. I, I wouldn't expect that. From what I've been seeing from people who drink ayahuasca and take antidepressants, it's just sometimes they only have strong, strong vomiting. That's the only point I would, I mean, nausea and 
uh, gastrointestinal effects. But then um, also, uh, but he hasn't done a an, an study on, on the interaction between another type of antidepressant, which are the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And these are the ones who I think are very, very, very dangerous. In this case, it's very important to avoid the combination. There are some medicaments that used for flu that might have a um, uh, monoamine oxidase um, inhibitor effect. So this is important to be careful about that. So we also need to study more that. The focus is basically in this, um, on these classes. Explorations, you name it. Ayahuasca can be used to study dreams, meditation, visions, um, what is the world, what is our consciousness, well, and also, also uh, how to adapt, develop, incorporate, acknowledge the, the ritual traditions inside this whole world of ayahuasca therapy, as we have seen in the ayahuasca track during these days as well. And then I just, to end it, um, I think it's very important that research a researcher of ayahuasca, in my opinion, has to be respectful of all uh, traditions. That might be difficult when the person entered when the person entered the ayahuasca world through one tradition, because you know how it goes with religions and traditions. The one tradition in where you are, you're in is the good one; all the other ones are not. <laughs> so I think for an, for an, um, for a researcher, it's important to make this movement of acknowledging the importance of all. Because all people who are working with ayahuasca have their value that we have, has to be recognized. Some of them may be charlatans in some situations, but then we have, to, um, we have to be aware of who are the good people working with that and getting closer to these people. And then which are the criteria for that. It's also something to be discussed. Also understanding that our understanding has limits, and this is more, uh, the, it's more of saying that we have to understand that some of the things that come from ayahuasca, perhaps we may, not, may never understand. It may be just a mystery. But it does, that wouldn't uh, stop us from learning more and for searching for more information. We're searching for information in terms of research. We're searching for information in terms of spiritual healing as well. Why not? And to, uh, last, last. Uh, I think it's. Im I've seen in the, this congress. Uh, I'll, I'll actually. I'll tell you what. What is my opinion about this subject? That's more or less like this. I've seen researchers who said in their presentations they, they are not. They don't deal with the political parts. They are just scientists. The political part is for activists. Then I'll say again. There's no naive science, and obviously they are taking political stance when they decide, when you decide to study psychedelics, you are taking a political stand. So I think, in my opinion, we have to speak out that. We have to be aware that we are activists in one field or the other of psychedelics. We are. And um, I had a, I don't have, my, my time is finished now, but I had the, uh, the situation of there is a new Law, a project of a new law, of a new act in Brazil that's going to be harsher on drugs. Having a problem with crack cocaine and this is, this is modeling the public opinion and people are getting very conservative about this in the moment. And I, I was invited to go for a, to give a talk at the, the Congress House. And I, <laughs> I went as a scientist. I went in as a scientist and I got out as a, an activist because I saw that when I, I gave all my lecture about uh, the information, and, and it has nothing to do directly with ayahuasca, but all the evidence they would say why that law that they were going to vote was not good. And at the end of it, <laughs> nobody listened. <laughs> it's just what listened to what was, you know, the voters, what they were, about the violence. And so uh, uh, I, I, I evidently didn't use, the, or probably whatever I would say, it would be the same thing. But, but anyway, I think that uh, in, a, in a broad perspective, perhaps not for that audience, uh, I've decided in my life to take a very clear position about that and to, to make my stand on that publicly. So I think this is important. I'm not recommending my decision for anyone. 
but I think everyone has to think about it. That's what I think. Thank you. Here's my email if you need it. Okay, um, I really want to thank Toffoli. I think this was excellent, and if only we had more medical doctors like that, I really think the world would be a better place. Um, I would like to, uh, we're gonna have half an hour of, of uh, extra on his session, but before we open to the public, I would like to invite both uh, Jacques Mabi and uh, Charles Grob to, if they wanna say some words uh, as feedback on what Toffoli said, especially regarding the topics of medication uh, and psychosis, this kind of more delicate stuff. I think it's an opportunity for us to hear from them as well. And so uh, I'll, I'll ask them to be brief so we have chance for the public to answer questions. And after that, uh, we're gonna have a session of questions. And I really hope you can cooperate and just make one question and be brief so all of us can participate. Uh, Thank you, Bia, and thank you, Luis Fernando. This is an excellent talk and very valuable. I appreciate your work. Um, but uh, from the perspective of an old dinosaur, <laughs> uh, uh, getting back to the issue of uh, serotonin syndrome, the, the cases that uh, came to our awareness, uh, all I believe, were of individuals who were on SSRIs for a period of time and who were entirely naive to uh, ayahuasca, and so there may, there may be a relation then as to the timing, and it, it remains my concern. It remains my concern that, uh, that an individual um, uh, who's been taking SSRIs, who then uh, it takes ayahuasca, there, there is a risk. Now, uh, it is, relatively speaking, it's a mild reaction compared to serotonin syndromes that have been reported with other drugs, but um, it's something to uh, be cognizant of. Um, you know, and it's, it, you know, the other issue is um, if someone needs an SSRI, should they be taking ayahuasca? Maybe they need to work through their process and uh, when they're in a more stable frame of mind, maybe that's the time for them to have this experience. It reminds me of the um, Herman Hess book, uh, Steppenwolf. You all recall uh, Magic Theater, not for everyone. <laughs> So um, this is a remarkable medicine. It's, it's a gift coming to us from the Amazon, from the indigenous people. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, the timing couldn't be better and our, our culture could benefit enormously, but it is not for everyone. So I th that's one issue to keep in mind. Um, let's see, you know, other, you know, I'm also interested in what the interaction of other compounds. I think another compound to avoid, a, a drug class to avoid would be stimulants. That could be deadly. So I think we need to be aware of that. I, I, I wonder about benzodiazepines in terms of relative risk or it, it just effect on the ayahuasca session. I'm trying to figure that out. No, no effect. Or, or sleep quite medication. Quite a yeah, yeah, well that, 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 that's reassuring. Something else that I've often thought of is what about the proscriptions that the, uh, the native peoples of the Amazon have carried with them uh, for millennia? Uh, not only dietary prescriptions, which are not oh, yeah, necessarily followed by the churches in Brazil, but there's also a proscription about uh, sexual activity in the days or weeks before. And for, you know, individuals with a strong constitution, a strong psychological stability that may not have any uh, I impact, but on vulnerable individuals with some elements of instability, that, that, that perhaps that might be problematic, at least it might need to be looked at in a more um, rigorous manner. Um, what else? I, I, another, I, I saw an interesting case when I was in Brazil many years ago 
of a young man with clear diagnosed bipolar 1 disorder, classic manic depressive illness, had had a, a, a very severe case, uh, many relapses, many hospitalizations, treated with high dose lithium. His brother was in the UDV, his brother was a physician. His brother brought him into the UDV and over time he was able to diminish his uh, daily dosage of lithium to about uh, 300 twice a day, which is a very modest dose, and he was participating in twice monthly sessions, and what they told me was that the, uh, it, it appeared to be, have a very therapeutic effect. So that's, that, that's another you know, interesting issue. Now what, one final concern I've had um, is periodically I get a call or an email from a family member or a friend of someone who's been down to the Amazon Basin, uh, generally a younger person um, who st has stayed there for a period of time, seems to have taken an excessive amount, you know, repeated sessions, and has uh, lost their moorings. They've become very confused, uh, delusional, uh, quite psychotic, have to be escorted back to the U.S. These, uh, these individuals turn out to be often, I find, difficult to treat. They don't respond well to uh, our co conventional uh, treatments uh, with antipsychotics. And I'm wondering, in your experience, are there any treatment recommendations you might have uh, for individuals who, you know, many people will have uh, transient anxiety uh, reactions, even a transient psychotic reaction, but uh, if it's sustained, prolonged, what, what would your treatment recommendations be? I don't know, you, may, you might want to respond to that. Thank, thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. Uh, you want me to answer later because I can, I, I want to say some things about you. Now or later? Yeah. Maybe. Uh, thank you very much for, for excellent points. Uh, one thing that uh, People from the UDV and from the DIME will recognize it. It's said like that. Uh, the UDV or the DIME, is the same saying, is for everyone. But not everyone is for the UDV or the DIME. And that's well, very, well, very well said. This is, this is very important. In the tr UDV tradition, Master Gabriel said that some people couldn't drink ayahuasca. People who had this, uh, what he said, a, s a strong emotional problem. You know, he used a very specific regional word for that. Um, not even a regional word, a very peculiar, I mean, only used in the DV. Um, regarding the case of people who, who might be drinking ayahuasca and, and lower uh, um, people with um, bipolar disorder, I've seen a case like that, exactly like that. The problem is that I have seen other cases where ayahuasca has had flipped them. So it's, it's pretty much for in, to our never level of, of knowledge unpredictable. I would, in this case, take the safer side and recommend. Otherwise, if the person is already established and uh, well and get going and everything, I wouldn't change it. But if a new patient comes to me and asks, I would say that I w I w it wouldn't be advisable. Um, unless, it depends very much on the situation of the case. If the person is taking medication, it's very stable. Sometimes it's just like any one of us, so it won't be any problem. So. About this confusion of states cases, that reminds me of the cases described by Lukov in, the, in his, his spiritual emergencies cases. They're very, very similar to them. Um, it's more or less, it's, it's the same thing. A young person gets too eager about drinking ayahuasca that was very common in the North, North Brazil, has sessions everywhere and go one day to one and then the other day to the other and all of a sudden in a week, the guy has drank ayahuasca like five, six times and then boom. And it's a confusion of state, There's no, there are no delusions, no, no hallucinations, it's just like a, some sort of dissociative state. D they don't uh, respond well to antipsychotic medication. And <laughs> really, I, I think this is more of a traditional healing uh, way of dealing with that. Perhaps Joe can take a, a little bit more. Well, I just want to tell one case, very, very briefly. Yes. Jacques, Jacques for certain can say about it a lot. <laughs> and uh, uh, one interesting case of a woman that arrived there in a confusional state and she said that she was, she, she, thought, she thought she was, she was pregnant. And she did a prognostic on it, it was, she, she wasn't supposedly pregnant and then she stayed for a while taking um, antipsychotic and then one day she came to me and she was okay and she said that she had quit medicament when she found out that she was really pregnant. And at the moment she knew she was pregnant, it just disappeared, the situation. Other cases similar to that. So 
um, I don't think Western psychiatry is ready to deal with these cases yet, so far, in my opinion, at the moment. There's another thing, but then I'll remember later. Bueno, saludos a todos. Voy a hablar en español. Disculpen, uh, mi inglés no es suficiente para hacer. Sorry to speak in Spanish. I know. Yeah. Eh, algunos puntos que quiero tocar me parecen centrales. Eh, Some en main topics I'm going to touch. En la tradición amazónica, indígena, chamánica. Amazonian indigenous chamanic traditions. Eh, el ayahuasca, el, la liana ayahuasca, es la que enseña, no la chacruna. The vine, uh, Benisteriopsis ayahuasca, is the one that teaches, not uh, chacruna. El ayahuasca es el libro, y la chacruna es la luz que permite leer el libro. Uh, uh, ayahuasca vine is the book, and chacruna is the light that allows you to read the book. Y por experiencia yo digo que ellos tienen razón. And by my own experience I say, I think that's right. Ahora tenemos que ver cómo funciona a nivel bueno, bioquímico, farmacológico, eso es el misterio, pero desde el punto de vista inicial creo que hay que considerar que, se, y por eso que también hay grupos que toman ayahuasca sin DMT y los efectos son eh, eh, reales, de repente no en el momento, pero en los sueños que siguen las tomas. So, uh, that's what they say, that's one thing, uh, he agrees to that, but we have to see how this uh, works from a biomedical point of view. And we also have to think why some groups take ayahuasca without DMT, uh, just, I mean, just the ayahuasca vine, like he said in his presentation. Entonces es un misterio que tú señalaste que me parece muy importante explorar, eh, analizar, ¿no? So you, you pointed out a mystery that I really agree, I think you have a point there, we have to explore that. El otro elemento es sobre la, los problemas de brotes psicóticos o riesgos para la salud mental. Ok, now we're going to talk about psychotic breaks and health to, uh, dangers to mental health. Primero, si se hace dentro de un contexto ritual correcto, hay fenómenos de autorregulación. If we are talking about a correct uh, ritual format, then there is elements of self-formation, uh, formatation in this context, in the proper ritual context. Autorregulación. ¿no? Uh, self-regulation. Significa que la persona que está en riesgo potencial posiblemente solamente vomita o no tiene nada. The person that is in a potential risk might just vomit and have nothing. Por ejemplo, vemos que los psicoanalistas lacanianos nunca tienen nada con ayahuasca. ¿Cómo? Psicoanalistas lacanianos. Uh, he's saying that Lacanian, Lacanian psychoanalysts never feel anything with ayahuasca. <laughs> Es una prueba de la autorregulación. That's just proof of uh, autoregulation. <laughs> en los brotes psicóticos, o llamados brotes psicóticos, yo creo que se puede eh, distinguir tres posibilidades. Regarding psychotic breaks, I think we can distinguish of, in three possibilities. Uno que es la toxicidad eh, farmacológica. Pharmacological toxicity. En este caso, es relativamente fácil, hay que purgar y limpiar y el, 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 el supuesto brote desaparece. Well, that's very easy. You have to purge, to clean, and then the alleged psychotic break will disappear. Eh, por ejemplo, los en las, en la, brotes psicóticos o psicosis eh, por consumo de marihuana o cannabis eh, no es realmente para mí, desde mi punto de vista, por lo general no es un problema realmente eh, mental sino de toxicidad y entonces con la desintoxicación nosotros recibimos a los pacientes y eh, no hay necesidad de, con las purgas todo es suficiente y recobran su normalidad. So, uh, for example, psychosis uh, regarding uh, related to cannabis using, uh, in his opinion, it's it's uh, the problem is toxic toxicity. So if you clean, if you purge that toxicity then there is not a problem of uh, psychosis anymore. Igual en las tradiciones amaz amazónicas, las plantas maestras, no teachers plants, también pueden ser tóxicas. Entonces, si uno hace una dieta con chirixanango, por ejemplo, si lo toma a dosis correctas, te enseña, te ayuda, pero si lo tomas en dosis eh, excesivas, también vas a hacer un brote psicótico. So, uh, in the tradition of the Peruvian Amazon, uh, in some teacher plants, they are also considered psychotic. So depending on how you take and the doses you take, you can also have uh, 
psychotic or yeah, no? brote psicótico. Psychotic breaks mm. regarding those plants. Y el, el segundo, la segunda posibilidad aparte de la toxicidad es, es la, eh, lo que yo llamaría contaminación espiritual. So I would call this toxicity spiritual contamination. No, no. Aparte. Huh? La toxicidad es uno. Es so, uh, his, sorry, the third element what is what he's calling spiritual uh, contamination. Para eso hay que entender eh, o hay que descubrir funcionar dentro del concepto del cuerpo energético y cuerpo espiritual. So for that we have to distinguish uh, two concepts: energetic body and spiritual body. body. Yeah. Entonces eh, no puedo explicar todos los detalles. Es muy largo, pero si hay una contaminación por una entidad, y ahí se introduce la noción de entidades autónomas, que yo hablé en mi conferencia, que no puedo repetir, pero que es el concepto tradicional y que yo lo considero como auténtico y válido. So, this is what I addressed in my talk. Uh, we're talking now of the influence of an autonomous entity, a spiritual entity from the outside that could influence uh, and have some sort of contact. Eso es también eh, relativamente fácil de liberar si uno conoce las técnicas chamánicas, ¿no? Para eh, liberar, exorcizar, expulsar esa entidad. So, if one knows shamanic techniques, I consider it kind of easy to uh, get rid of this if one knows how to purge, to clean, to exorcise these entities. Y entonces el, el, el famoso brote psicótico desaparece en forma instantánea casi. So the famous psychotic break uh, dis uh, disappears like kind of instantaneously almost. No hay realmente un problema de salud mental profundo. There is not really a problem of a profound mental health issue. Y la tercera alternativa, o sea, primero toxicidad, segundo infestación, vamos a decir espiritual, y la tercera es, bueno, problema de salud mental, estructural. So, first one he mentioned is toxicity. Second one spiritual contamination and third one is uh, per se a kind of uh, mental health problem eso también había que explorar si realmente existen problemas de salud mental eh, puros sin dimensión espiritual so we have to explore if there are really just uh, mental health problems that are just uh, uh, mental health problems without any spiritual dimensions to it por eso es importante lo que señaló eh, 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 Luis eh, Toffoli de cómo introducir dentro de la investigación la dimensión ritual, el setting y el contexto energético, espiritual, que es fundamental. Si excluimos eso, no entendemos la mitad de lo que pasa con Ayahuasca. Uh, so that's why he agrees with Toffoli that when you do scientific research about Ayahuasca, you have to some include ritual and that dimension into the analysis because if you exclude that you, uh, he wonders how much are you getting of the experience eh, también dentro de la, del estudio la presentación de la ayahuasca yo creo que es importante señalar los riesgos negativos peligros pero también los riesgos positivos ¿no? so uh, When talking about scientific study of ayahuasca, you have to, uh, he thinks it's important to include not only negative risks, but also positive risks. Mm -hmm. Y un punto que quiero señalar, porque eh, no lo escuché toda la conferencia y para mí es, una, es un punto importante. Eh, yo no doy ayahuasca a las personas que tienen eh, problemas eh, de desórdenes alimenticios tipo anorexia y bulimia. So he wants to stress a point that he didn't hear in his presentation that regards giving ayahuasca to people that have uh, uh, food-related disorders, such eating disorders, such as uh, anorexia and bulimia. As, uh, creo que es muy arriesgado, muy peligroso y puede no solamente no solucionar el problema, pero reactivarlo. He thinks that's very risky and might not only help not solve it, but even enhance it. Y eso yo creo que hay que considerar eh, como un elemento de descarte o en todo caso de mucho cuidado. Claro, depende de la gravedad, eh, de la, pero en, en realmente eh, historias fuertes de anorexia y bulimia, yo no uh, acepto dar ayahuasca. 
well, of course, there's many variations and graduations, but all in all, what I'm trying to say is that if there is serious uh, uh, anorexia and bulimia, I would kind of discard those cases because they can get really bad. Eso para resumir lo que puede aportar. That's a summary of what I think I could add to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to do the following. We're going to have uh, three questions and then Toffoli back. I just want to say uh, my part on, on the answers regarding uh, parenting. There is no paper about that. There I wrote no a paper, paper about uh, uh, pregnancy and children. It's on the uh, Journal of Psychoactive Drugs. Uh, there's not a lot of ethnographic data on how do kids, how do kids uh, feel ayahuasca. I, when we worked in a journalistic review uh, for Hedge Global uh, story, we interviewed a lot of kids of Mapia, maybe 30, and we had them sitting on a chair telling their stories. And it was very neat. They do have some uh, psychoactive feelings, but mainly it, it has not been uh, addressed. And I, I want to recommend, also take the chance to do a little marketing of my books that are here. There is a <laughs> one book that Toffoli mentioned, has an interview with Jacques, and he addresses a little bit this topic of an anadoxia there. So the books and Anorexia. classic cards are here if you want to look in the break, okay? Let's just... Thanks, Bia. Well, uh, uh, regarding pain pills, um, I have no experience on that because uh, we don't have the problem. This, so far, we haven't got this problem in Brazil. Actually, we don't have problems with opiates in general. So I have no experience at all with opiates. So I, I can't answer that question, unfortunately. Perhaps Jack, because he's seen a lot of, uh, to, to, uh, perhaps Joe, I don't know. I've seen people with heroin addiction. I don't know if it's, but it's not the same thing as, as pain pills. So I'm sorry. Um, about eating disorders, um, eating disorders are a group of disorders that are very complex and peculiar. They are not connected to the psychotic disorders, they are a group of themselves. One important and interesting thing about them is that they might be a, some sort of Western mental disorder that's found only in the westernized countries, and the more westernized the place becomes, more common they become as well. There's some evidence of that. So uh, it's some sort of a disorder of modernity, as I may say. And um, I, I have no experience of people with eating disorders in, 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 in the UDV or that were there or drinking ayahuasca. So I also, uh, I think this is a question that perhaps if we have time, uh, Jacques could answer about going a little more about this situation and, and whether it would be advisable to give someone with a past, hi past history. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I've seen some people who had past history of eating disorders, normally bulimia, anorexia is, is more severe, so it was normally bulimia, that, that were members of the UDV. But I'm not quite sure of it, so I'll please don't publish. <laughs> Again, another problem. I, um, since my experience in, in Brazil, basically the, the religious traditions only uh, make the tea with, basically, with very few exceptions, only with um, uh, ay uh, ayahuasca divine and and um, chakruna, psychotraviridis. So we don't have much experience on that, but there is a chapter in this book which uh, um, Bia mentioned that there has an exception, an exception about healing plants used in, in the UDV, and also in the book Ayahuasca and Salud, for those who speak Spanish, deals with that as well. But I personally don't have clinical experience about the admixture, admixture plants in, in ayahuasca and mental health situations. Uh, about the study of, uh, I would like to see this study about parenting, very, very interesting stuff. Actually, we need a lot of quality. I haven't said that, and so your question was good because it, it uh, gives me the opportunity to say that we need a lot of qualitative studies. studies. I wanted to do one, I want to interview psychiatrists. Who, um, who had experienced ayahuasca and, and their patients. So I'll talk to Charles uh, if he want to be a subject of this study, uh, and Jacques as well, and I want to do it globally to see what happens, what do you see? Well, this, this is information, this is um, high quality information that it's uh, just spread around and we have to, and sometimes qualitative studies m can solve that and can give you a lot of advice and, and, and insight for where we should look at 
quantitative, quantitatively as well. Um, about the intense vomiting um, doc, uh, Dr. Morton has um, mentioned that he un underwent, uh, I must say that I have had quite my f a few of these situations as well. Not so commonly, but uh, I am one of, one of these sensitive persons. I don't take my, um, too much I ask. I have to be careful with that. Uh, but Jace Calloway has published uh, uh, a paper a while ago about the uh, polymorphisms of uh, cytochrome that might explain. Uh, there are slow metabolizers and, and, and fast metabolizers of ayahuasca. So there is, there is already some information on this, and, but we need more information on that. But let me just see if there is anything else. About your question, um, it's the difficult question. I think it's better if I talk to you in person because it's, it's going to be a little bit, okay? I'm sorry, there's no more time for questions because I really respect our break times too. And uh, so we're going to have 15 minute break right now. It's 11, we're going to gather again at 11.15, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Tafolin. <laughs>